Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be talking about the parable of the workers in the vineyard. We're going to be talking about the third time that Jesus predicted his death. We're going to be talking about a mother's special request, and also the story of two blind men. Let's get right into this. This is uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man who was the master of a household, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius, now it says here in the notes, a denarius is a silver Roman coin worth one twenty-fifth of a Roman arius. This was a common wage for a day of farm labor. So hard labor, one day's of hard, uh, worth of hard labor is worth a denarius. When he had agreed with the laborers, so he, this, this man hired a whole bunch of guys and said, okay, every one of you, I'm going to pay each one of you a denarius, which is a fair wage. He sent them into his vineyard. So they had a contract, they had an agreement. He went out for... He went out at about the third hour, which says here the time was measured from sunrise to sunset. So the third hour would be about 9 a.m. And others saw standing, excuse me, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So he didn't really, he wasn't specific there, you see. He just said, whatever is right, I'll give you. So they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, so that would be about noon and about 3 p.m., and did likewise. About the eleventh hour, he went out, that would be about 5 p.m., and found others standing idle. He said to them, why do you stand here all day idle? Why are you doing nothing? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and you will receive whatever is right. When the evening had come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning from the last to the first. So do the last first, okay? Do the first last. Very interesting here. When those who who were hired at about the eleventh hour came, they each received a denarius. Wow! They only worked for a little while, and they got paid for a whole day's uh, uh, labor. When the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and likewise, each received a denarius. When they received it, they murmured against the master of the household, saying, These last have spent one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and, uh, and the scorching heat? That's not fair, they were saying. Not fair at all. We worked for a long time and you you only give us, you gave us the same amount as what you give these other people that only worked for an hour? That's not fair. We did hard work. We're out there in the sun. We're, 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 you know, the sun's beating on us and hard in the heat of the day, you know, scorching heat. Verse 13. But he answered one of them. He said, friend. I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me for for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. It's my desire to give to to this last just as much as to you. Isn't it lawful to do or for me to do what I want with what I own? Or is your eye evil? In other words, you're envious, you're jealous. Is your eye evil because I'm good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Verse 17. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside. And on and on the way he said to them, Okay, no, here again, we've got you got to understand John, out of all the disciples, was the closest one to, to Jesus. After that, Peter, James. So we've got Peter, James, and John. They were the closest ones. Uh, after that were the 12. They obviously knew that Jesus knew the Lord more, more than anybody else. Because here you see, for example, Jesus singled out just the 12. Okay, you guys, just you 12. I just want to talk to you. 
Okay, so he favorited the 12 in that sense, as opposed to just everybody else that was following him. So he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, behold, that means, okay, I want you to look at, I want you to notice something. That's what behold means. Look at this. Notice this. Take note of this. You know, pay attention to this. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the uh, to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, and to crucify. And the third day he will be raised up. Hmm. Once again, for those of you who are new and watching these videos, um, listening to these teachings, the term son of man is a very unique term. Actually found, as far as we know so far, the term son of man finds its roots, its origin in the book of Enoch. Enoch says a lot about a son of man. That is taught that literally in the Hebrew, Ben Adam, son of Adam, or seed of Adam. And anybody who knew anything about what that meant knew that it was a direct and, you know, an obvious reference to the Messiah. Because the first promise of the Messiah that we see in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1, or excuse me, uh, what would that be? Genesis chapter 3, I believe it is, where God promised that the seed, the seed of the woman, or the seed that would be the, uh, also the seed of Adam, uh, because it says that God called them Adam, you know, uh, both uh, man and woman was both called Adam. So the seed of the woman, or the seed of Adam, it would have to be the seed of Adam, uh, would bruise the serpent's, or would crush the serpent's head, okay? And that is a reference to the um, the Messiah coming and crushing the head of, of the devil, okay? So that is, uh, the word son of man here goes all the way back to Genesis, okay? The term son of man goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, referring specifically and explicitly to, to the Messiah, okay? It's kind of interesting, too, also to note that Jesus spoke of himself as a third person, almost. Like, you know, he, he talked about himself as if, you know, in, in the third person. He didn't say, I'm going to be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, although, you know, we all know that's what he, that's what he meant. Uh, he didn't say, I will be condemned to death. He didn't say, I will be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked, to, to be scourged, and to be crucified. And I will rise on the third day. He said, the Son of Man. So, again, he really, really hammered this in home. That he is the Son of Man. He is the seed of Adam. He is the Messiah. You know, it it wouldn't have been as powerful if he would have just said, I, 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 I. The, The fact that he said, Son of Man, made it much more powerful because he was tagging himself as being the Mashiach, the Messiah. Verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, kneeling and asking a certain thing of, of him. He, sa- uh, he said to her, what do you want? So obviously this woman came to Jesus, came to Yeshua, wanting something. She was, she was asking, uh, she, was, she obviously came... Uh, wanting something from the Lord. And so uh, Jesus said, what do you want? She said, command that these, (laughs) interesting how she worded it, command that these, my two sons, may sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand in your kingdom. Mm, Wow. Wow. Uh, what more can a mother ask for, <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's quite the quite the request. Uh, and honestly, you know, uh, assuming or understanding that that her two sons is James and John, one being the John that was the closest to Jesus. Okay, the beloved disciple. You know, he says that the disciple whom Jesus loved, obviously implying that he loved that one in a you know not the other one so to speak that that was his favorite okay the disciple whom Jesus loved being John so it very well could have been that he that she actually got that request at least 
half of that request in John. But anyway, let's see what Jesus said in uh, verse 22. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> you're asking for a huge thing. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Now, what is he talking about? Uh, for those of you who know the story, when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane just before he was arrested, just before he was crucified, he prayed and he said, Father, take this cup from me. The cup of death. Okay? The cup of death. The cup of, the cup of martyrdom. That included, if I could make it sound, like if I could put it in, in a this way. That was like a concoction of... Self-denial, humility, great humility. It says in, the, in, uh, in Paul's letters, Paul said that, that Jesus humbled himself to obedience, even to the death of the cross. You understand, the death of the cross was one of the most horrific and one of the most humiliating deaths that anybody could ever have, being totally stripped of their clothes. I'm not, not even wearing a little napkin <laughs> totally stripped of their clothes and beaten and whipped and to their skin torn off and the beard pulled out of them totally just butchered okay hung publicly for everybody to see and dying dying publicly for everybody to see very horrific very horrific this is the cup are you able to drink the cup that i'm about to drink humbling yourself okay draining yourself of all pride, humbling yourself to obedience to the death of the cross, or at least to total and utter self-denial. Where you deny everything, you, 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 you sacrifice everything, all of your wants, all of your plans, all of your life, all of your reputation. If, that, if it means sacrificing your friends, so be it. I mean, the scriptures say, come out from among them. Come out from among who? The worldly people, the secular people. Come out from among them, says the Lord, and be separate. Then I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. Are you able to drink the cup that I am, able, that, that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now, this is the baptism of fire, okay? The scriptures use fire as a symbol of death, okay? There's the baptism of water, the baptism of repentance, the baptism of, you know, symbolically speaking, the baptism of the Spirit. Then there's the baptism of fire. Now, a lot, a lot of charismatic uh, brothers and sisters get this a little bit a little bit mixed up because they think that the, the baptism of fire is just when they feel fire or they, they, they feel, you know, uh, enthusiastic, that they feel like they're just fired up, so to speak, you know, fired up and, and very, very, um, you, know, um, you know, just invigorated. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The baptism here is the baptism of fire, which is the baptism of death. Fire also speaks of purification, the fire that purifies gold, that burns out all the chaff. So this is the baptism that he's speaking about. Are you, are you able to be baptized with the real baptism of fire that will burn out all of your sin in your life, that you, that we, you will really, truly be able to say, I am crucified with Christ. That you completely identify every area of your life with the crucifixion, the death of Yeshua. That you die with him. Being baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. So that you can say, truly say, all of the old is gone. The old life is gone. The old passions are gone. The old me is gone. The old self is gone. The old selfish desires, they're all gone. The old lust is gone. All we got left is just the faith of God. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live truly walking in the Spirit, not in sin. Okay? Baptized. 
as, as even Paul said in Romans chapter 6, how can you who are dead to sin, baptized by fire, how can you who are dead to sin live in it any longer? You can't. If you're truly baptized with this baptism, sin is long gone. Sin is long gone. I can just hear someone say, well, it's impossible to not sin. In the eyes of men, yes, because the eyes of men have got way more laws than the eyes of than the laws of God. Did you know I've heard that um, it was estimated? I mean, it, it, in the United States of America alone, okay, I'm sure that it's similar with a lot of other countries around the world, but in the United States of America alone, lawyers don't even know exactly how many laws there are. I've heard that they they estimate about four million laws, four million. And a lot of Christians say they're law-abiding. They're law-abiding in the sense of law, you know, of the law of the country, the law of the land, the law of their their nation, the law of their the, the law of, of man, more or less. They they claim to be law-abiding citizens. So you're claiming to actually obey and abide by four million laws, and you have a problem with just a few of God's laws, a few. They say there's 613 laws in, all, in, in the entire Torah, in the entire scope of the books of Moses. Most of those laws don't even apply to the common man. I mean, there's laws for the priests, laws for the Levites, laws for uh, all kinds. There's laws for women, there's laws for children, there's laws for men, there's laws for all kinds of different things. So of those 613, not six, you're, you're not... God does not expect you to obey all 613. Yet, a lot of Christians claim to be law-abiding law citizens in America. You're, you're obeying, you are proud of obeying four million laws, but you can't obey just a few hundred or even just a few dozen or even just less than 10 or even just the 10 commandments. You know what I mean? It's hypocrisy. Okay, I'll sum it up in one word, hypocrite, <laughs> hypocrisy. They said to him, we are able, we're able to be baptized with the baptism that, you're, that you are about to be baptized with, Lord. He said, you indeed, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give but it is for whom it has been prepared by my father. Hmm. So we don't know if she actually got that request. Verse 24, when the 10 heard it, the 10, okay, so we're talking about Peter, or excuse me, James and John. This is all to do with James and John, basically. But when the other 10 heard it, you know, Peter and the other nine, uh, they were indignant with the two brothers, how dare you? They were mad. They were, they were just angry with them. Verse 25. But Jesus summoned them. Come here, come here, come here. And said to them, You know that the rulers of the nations, the Gentiles, that would be, lorded over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. That's not the way it works. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why I understand that the Orthodox Church uh, and the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church actually split off from the Orthodox Church because the Catholic Church wanted to have this hierarchy of like the Pope and such, whereas the Orthodox Church did not fancy that idea, okay, of having this authority kind of thing. Uh, Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. Well, you got somebody lording it over you and this kind of stuff. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. The TR, which is what the King James is based upon, says, let him be instead of shall be. So uh, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Uh, of course, in the, many of the other ma manuscripts, the majority of the manuscripts that we have today says, shall be your servant. Whoever desires to be the first among you shall be your bondservant, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
verse 29. As they went out from Jericho, Jericho, they, uh, a great multitude followed him. Behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, you son of David. Again, a lot of Christians read this and it just flies right over their head. They don't really understand what, what was really said here. The son of David, even today in Jewish circles, even today, son of David means Messiah. Mashiach. Lord, have mercy on us. Messiah, son of David, Mashiach. And that's because uh, it was prophesied over David that his seed would be the Messiah. Okay? That's why the term son of David is obviously referring to the Messiah just as son of Adam is or son of man. Verse 31, the multitude rebuked them telling them that they should be quiet. But they cried out even uh, they cried out even more. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus stood still and called them and asked, "What do you want me to do for you?" Obviously, it was very apparent that they wanted something. They they were they wanted something of the Lord. They told him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Jesus, being moved with compassion, touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. I would be following him. I'd be following him too if that happened. I mean, hey, wow. Even seeing it. Even reading it. (laughs) I would be following him. Um, Now, take note here. Verse 34. Jesus did this miracle seemingly because of, at least, I can't say because of only one reason, but there's one here that is explicitly spelled out for us. So the whole motivation behind this miracle was compassion. Okay? There are some people, few thankfully, that uh, believe that the miracles were only just to validate the Bible. Nowhere does it say that in the scriptures. Nowhere. Miracles were done. Jesus made it very clear. This is, you know, number one, so that people would turn, repent, and believe. How do we know that? Because he, re- he rebuked people for seeing the miracles and not repenting and believing. He rebuked them harshly and judged them and condemned them harshly because they did not believe in the you know, in the face of the miracles. We know that that is the primary purpose of, that is the primary reason for the miracles, the signs and wonders. By the way, if you're in a circle fellowship group or church that does these signs and wonders and you don't hear much about repentance or, uh, you know, repentance from sin and, you know, turning from sin and, you know, being... uh, being completely born again, dead to sin, and living to God in righteousness. If you don't hear much about that, your signs and wonders might be in vain. Jesus here did this, it says, moved with compassion. Jesus still does miracles today, albeit not as often as a lot of people think. However, he still does miracles today for the same reasons. So they would repent. And sometimes just because of his compassion. Something to think about. Once again, may God enlighten your eyes and open your understanding so that you would understand these, uh, these words, that you would understand what we talked about in this session, and just it would be a great blessing to you. So thanks for watching again. Make sure you share this video. Tell others about it and and um, like it. And may God bless you. Thanks again for watching.